test is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome back to our, um, our regular participants and welcome to anyone who's a first-time participant of our economic development webinar series. My name is Jessica Ritchie. I'm with the Regional Programs and Engagement Branch of the Ministry of Trade, Jobs, Trade and Technology. And I'll be providing the technical support for today's webinar. I'm located in Victoria, British Columbia, on the unceded Coast Salish territory of the Lekwungen people, known today as the Esquimalt and Songhees First Nation. Today's webinar is going to be on small-scale licensed cannabis production in British Columbia. It's a topic that we've had a lot of requests about, and we know that there's a gap in information, and we're hoping that today is going to help solve some of those um, questions that people have and provide resources and information that you'll be able to use if you are supporting people that are trying to get into the industry or you're someone who's interested in getting into it yourself. I'm going to go over some of the housekeeping just in case you haven't used uh, the GoToWebinar platform before. I'll introduce our speakers and then we're going to get into it. We have a ton of great content to cover today, so you're not going to be hearing too much from me. So uh, if you haven't used this um, platform before, first the thing that you should know is that all of our audience members are muted. Um, this just provides uh, a little bit of protection for us from technical issues. Um, but if you have any questions, there is a question box. Please type your questions into that question pane. We will be having a question and answer period at the end of the session. And if you're having any technical challenges um, during the session, type your questions in there and we'll be happy to reach out and try and help you. The other thing that you should know, if you're having any challenges with your um, audio, it may be a network issue. You don't have to use your computer. You do have the option to use your phone. You can just use the radio button for phone call, click on that, and you'll be able to, um, a phone number will pick, uh, pop up with a pin, and you'll be able to join uh, the audio that way, and then you can follow along with the visuals on your computer. You should also be aware we are going to be recording this session if you're seeing really valuable information here and want to share it. We'll be posting this as well as the sli presentation slides on our website, gov.bc.ca backslash economic development. You can look under the, our section for uh, BC Ideas Exchange and it shows all of our past webinars. If you're new to our webinar series, you'll also see our entire library of webinars and other content that we've covered. So if you're in the economic development world, you're looking to support, support small businesses or anything like that, um, check out our other webinars because you may see some value there if you're seeing value today. And um, that brings us through our housekeeping and I would just like to introduce, we have three great speakers that are going to cover a variety of topics um, regarding small scale cannabis or licensed cannabis. We're going to start first um, with BC's Cannabis Legislation and Re Regulation Secretariat. They'll be speaking to the province's approach to cannabis legalization and regulation. This is just going to be about 10 minutes and just kind of provide an overview of what the province is doing, especially if you're not uh, aware or you're new to this topic. Then we're going to hear from Shannon Ross. She's the Cannabis Business Transformation Advisor with Community Futures, and she's going to be sharing information about business supports that are available to people looking to enter this industry, as well as some of the things that communities and as well as growers should be thinking about when they're entering this, um, entering the licensed small-scale cannabis production. And then finally, we're going to hear from Tamara Follett. She's one of Canada's first federally licensed a micro cultivators and she's going to be sharing her experience on the application process and how she was successful. This is such a new area and we don't haven't heard from a lot of people that have gone through the whole application process. So she's a great resource to share why she was successful um, and some of the things that she did well that made her um, be one of the first people that had her application approved. And then at the end of the session, like I said, we uh, we've saved some time for people to ask questions. Throughout the presentation, if, if you, or if your question isn't answered at the end of the session, people are going to be sharing their contact information and then resources where other questions can go to. Be sure that you're jotting those down so that you're able to um, touch base if you have further questions after and you can use the resources that are being shared. If you don't have time, like I said, we will be presenting this, posting the slides at the end as well. So that'll be a second opportunity to get that information that was shared. And with that, I'm going to hand it over to BC's Cannabis, Cannabis Legislation and Regulation Secretariat. Thanks, Jessica. So I'm just going to give a quick overview of BC's approach to legalization and regulation.
next. Yeah, there we go. So this is a quick um, overview of the provincial priorities. I think probably most of you that are from BC will be familiar with these. So um, these are the goals that the province set up and largely the focus in the lead up to legalization was on public health and safety. But from the very um, outset of knowing that legalization was coming, BC also set the goal of supporting economic development as a priority for the province. And you'll hear about that more later in the webinar. Next slide, please. So this is just a really high level overview. It is not uh, comprehensive at all of Health Canada's responsibilities under the Cannabis Act. So um, they issue licenses for cannabis production and processing, including micro and standard cultivation, licensed producer sales of medical cannabis, as well as licenses for analytical testing and research. Health Canada also regulates all cannabis products, that's medical and non-medical. This includes products that are legal for sale. So for example, probably most people are familiar that three new classes of cannabis products um, have been legalized for production and commercial sale. So that's edibles, extracts and topicals. So Health Canada was the one who set those regulations. They also regulate product safety, quality, labeling, packaging, as well as promotion and display. And the federal government is still responsible for the medical cannabis regime. That didn't change with legalization. They continue to regulate that. So under federal legislation, patients can access medical cannabis in one of three ways. So one way is directly from a licensed producer um, that is authorized by Health Canada. The other way is to register with Health Canada so that they can produce their own non or medical cannabis. And uh, the third option is to designate someone else to produce that medical cannabis for them. Next slide, please. So in BC, we have two main pieces of legislation that provide for legal safe access to non-medical cannabis. Um, the Cannabis Control and Licensing Act is the piece of legislation that sets the legal age of 19 um, to purchase and uh, consume cannabis. It also allows adults to possess up to 30 grams of cannabis in a public place. It prohibits cannabis smoking and vaping everywhere. Tobacco smoking and vaping are prohibited, as well as playgrounds, sports fields, skate parks, and other places where children commonly gather. It prohibits the use of cannabis on school properties and in vehicles. It also authorizes adults to grow up to four non-medical cannabis plants at home in their household. Um, the act also established the private retail licensing regime, and it also uh, provided enforcement authority to a new enforcement unit called the Community Safety Unit that is within the Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, and they are primarily focused on um, illegal cannabis retail sales. And the second piece of legislation is the Cannabis Distribution Act. And so that act uh, establishes the liquor distribution branch as the provincial wholesale distributor of non-medical cannabis. And it also establishes the government run retail sales in store and online. This is the BC cannabis stores. Next slide, please. So in BC, um, the responsibility for cannabis is pretty much split between two ministries. So Ministry of Public Safety and Solicitor General, um, that is where the Cannabis Legalization and Regulation Secretariat resides. Um, so the Secretariat was established in April of 2017 and is BC's central coordinating body for cannabis policy and regulation. And then, as I mentioned, there's the Community Safety Unit, and this is the group that has the enforcement authority to take action against illegal cannabis retailers. And then there's also the Security Programs Division. Um, so this group is uh, responsible for carrying out security screenings for cannabis retail applicants, and also those who work in licensed retail stores, government cannabis stores, and other government cannabis related operations. So then under Ministry of Attorney General, that's where we have liquor and cannabis regulation branch. So they're responsible for processing the private retail applications and regulating legal retailers. And then we have LDB, and as mentioned, they're the wholesale distributor of non-medical cannabis. And they are also responsible for running the bricks and mortar BC cannabis stores, as well as the online site. Next slide, please. 
So if you have any questions, this is how you can contact the Cannabis Secretariat. We're happy to help where we can. So uh, that's our email address. You can also go to uh, our Get Cannabis Clarity website. And there's also email contacts on there for the Community Safety Unit, the Secretariat, um, LDB, uh, as well as Liquor and Cannabis Regulation Branch. So that main landing page there has contact for all of us. And uh, that concludes my part of the presentation. Fantastic. Thank you so much. So um, like I said before, there will be a question and answer period at the end of the session. So if you have questions for the Cannabis Legalization and Regulation Secretariat, absolutely contact them via email or you maybe have an opportunity to ask those at our question and answer period at the end of our session. So with that, we're going to move on to our next presenter, Shannon Ross from Community Futures. So I'm going to hand it over to her. Uh, my name is Shannon Ross, and I work for Community Futures here in Nelson, British Columbia, and I am the Cannabis Business Transition Advisor, and uh, I'm also a farmer. I've been involved in agriculture for over 20 years, and I am an advocate for medical cannabis and uh, like to spend time educating people on cannabis. Uh, Community Futures uh, has been in Nelson since 1985, and we assist people with uh, business training, loans, counseling, and resources, and we also bring key community partners together to uh, work towards common goals, sustainable uh, community economic development. Uh, our local region, uh, both regional and municipal government, has been very supportive of the cannabis industry. Uh, in our region, in the Kootenays, it's estimated that approximately 30% or more of our economy is reliant on the cannabis industry. Uh, so our municipal government in particular uh, spent a lot of time doing kind of uh, stakeholder and public input, and uh, so uh, they were very supportive. The next slide. So here's an overview of the licensing. Uh, there are different ways to get involved with cannabis. So you can grow cannabis on a large scale, which is a standard cultivation license, or on a smaller scale, which is a micro cultivation license. And you can also uh, apply for a nursery license. And you can also process if you want to make products uh, or if you want to sell. You need either a standard processing license or a micro processing license. Uh, you can also get a license for, for uh, medical purposes, analytical testing, and research and development. Next slide, please. So, um, operating a cannabis business uh, other than cultivation and processing or retail there are many other opportunities uh, and small business in the cannabis sector uh, the craft se sector is uh, there's a lot of opportunity there in 2018 98 percent of all businesses in bc were considered small businesses and this represents approximately 500,000 small businesses employing approximately 1 million people and accounts for 44% of the total employment in BC. Micro businesses, those with less than five employees, comprise about 83% of small businesses. And it estimates that the cannabis economic contribu contribution to BC is 1.3 to $2.5 billion, more than forestry. The next slide, please. There are many uh, small businesses in the cannabis, cannabis sector. Uh, there are a lot of ancillary businesses that support this industry. And I'm just going to quickly go through the next few slides because uh, I don't have a lot of time. But uh, the next few slides just highlight some of the construction workers, plumbers, electricians, uh, technology, fencing, uh, security contractors, bookkeepers, 
can keep the next slide. Uh, so there are lots uh, of other ancillary businesses that support these sectors. The next slide, please. And the next slide. Lawyers is another one. There we go. So dried flour is just one product that, uh, and there's also the concentrate market, which uh, is estimated to comprise up to 56% or more. That is of edibles, uh, tinctures, topicals, beverages. Uh, dried cannabis is just a small, not a small section, but just a piece of it. Uh, and I think that there'll be more of a movement going towards the concentrate market. Uh, as it's now just been legalized. Uh, a lot of people don't just smoke cannabis, so there's many other uses, uh, as well as uh, CB, high CBD content. Uh, so I think we're going to see a lot more uh, businesses going to the concentrate market. Next slide, please. Where will you fit in? If you're interested in getting involved with the cannabis industry, I'm going to focus a lot on the cultivation aspect of it. Uh, it's, you can consider outdoor cultivation versus indoor cultivation. It's good to research the various models uh, and the startup costs and the operating costs of each model. Indoor facilities are capital intensive, uh, high, high risk. They require a broad suit of business skills. And the indoor model, though, does provide year-round income and stable income. Outdoor cultivation can support other farm activities and requires less capital. And you can scale up uh, as, you, as your business grows. Market height means many firms enter the market, but efficient operations and regulatory compliance will create sustainable enterprises. The next slide. So things to know before you go too far on uh, a piece of property. Your zoning is an important aspect. So before you get too far ahead of your business, it's important to understand what zone your property is uh, located in and, uh, and if it is allowed. Here in our region, uh, there is, uh, you can have cannabis facilities uh, in industrial, commercial, agricultural, in the ALR. Uh, so there are quite a few options here. Uh, the other part is water, how much water is required and what your water license is. And it, is it it's good to test your water and to make sure that it's potable. And also, power. Uh, it's really important to know if your power company can provide you with power that you need, especially if you're looking at doing more of an indoor production. Uh, it's so uh, usually what power companies are requiring is uh, a somewhat of a facility design, knowing what your power consumption is, having an electrician come in and review everything and then call your power company and provide them as, with as much information as possible and just make sure that they can provide you with the power that is required uh, depending on where you're located. And just also looking at your building and are you going to be renovating your building or building a new building and to look closely at the different costs associated with that. And of course, looking at the good production practices and the regulations and what is required. The next slide. So it is important to hire accountants and lawyers when you're setting up your business. Uh, they do help reduce your tax burden and they ensure agreements are binding and represent the interest of their clients. They have seen thousands of businesses and they know what works and what doesn't. And it's important for shareholders or partnership agreements. Uh, it's important to have things written down. It's also good to hire a bookkeeper and also Project managers are, I see um, some of the more the larger facilities that are being built, uh, having a project manager really helps keep things organized. Uh, and uh, there's definitely something to be said about hiring expertise when uh, starting a larger kind of micro cultivation facility. Next slide. 
next slide. The exercise duty, so this is the syntax. It is applied and remitted by the license processor upon packaging. A CRA license is required to sell, uh, to distribute to the consumer. It requires a background check. It requires a business plan submission. And the CRA bond for a micro cultivator is $5,000 and for a standard processor, sorry, for microprocessor. And for a standard processor, it can be up to five million and is a percentage of your estimated revenue. Uh, you can, there's a link provided if you want to look more into the excise duty. Okay, so possible sources of capital. Um, if you have savings, friends and family are the most common source of investment. You can sell your assets and your property. Community Futures, uh, we do have a finance department and we are uh, currently lending money to uh, micro cultivators. There are banks and credit unions. However, uh, that has been a bit more challenging for a lot of the micro cultivators and I do encourage banks and credit unions to get to understand the regulations and I'll get more into that in a little bit. And private investment. The next slide. So risk mitigation is an important piece of uh, looking towards becoming a cultivator or processor. And failing to comply with the regulations is uh, one of the most, uh, the major risks for this business. So staying on top of bookkeeping, your inventory management, and your CP sale tracking. Uh, it can be a bit daunting or intimidating the amount of uh, record keeping uh, that is required to operate a cannabis facility. There are solutions in place. There are many software companies out there that do make the record keeping and monthly reports quite easy. So I do encourage people not to get too intimidated and to do your research on software companies. Analytical testing. So all uh, the, if you have a processing license and you're selling cannabis, you do have to uh, send in samples to analytical labs and make sure that you do pass um, pesticides and mold and mildew, uh, metals and um, pathogens. So uh, you, as a cultivator, it's really important to uh, look at the products that you're using and make sure that they are products that uh, are on Canada's recommended uh, recommended pesticides, for example, uh, and just make sure that you do your research on what products that you can use as a cultivator. Uh, fire. So when you're building your operations, make sure that they do meet fire and best practices, and you can get a fire smart description for your property and make sure that you mitigate the risks of wildfire. Insufficient startup capital. So uh, it's important to remember in addition to your construction budget that you need operating capital. If you're going to a processing license, you need your uh, bond for your excise tax and you also need, need a contingency plan for the overhead cost. Next slide. Things to consider for cultivators. If you're considering hiring someone to write your business plan, it, uh, be mindful and take the time to understand your business. Understand your startup budget and your operating budget and plan to have financing in place to operate until your revenue comes in. A generic business plan is difficult to approach cultivators with. Talk to your neighbors. Honesty goes a long way. Have a plan to share and discuss common concerns, such as traffic, light pollution, air pollution, and how you mitigate the risks. Uh, we have found through personal experience, I, uh, I've noticed that uh, elevators that are open to their neighbors, and it's, it's good to come to your neighbor and say, listen, this is my plan, this is kind of, 
uh, operation I want to do, whether it's outdoor or indoor. And everybody pretty much has the same common concerns. I know how many people are going to be driving down the road. If there's is there going to be light pollution? Is there going to be smell? All of those things can all can be mitigated. Uh, people can carpool. A micro cultivation um, is going to have a maximum pretty much of five time employees. Uh, it's uh, going to be drastically uh, affecting the traffic in the area. So it's good to have those conversations. Um, and that will mitigate the risk along the way and prevent neighbors from uh, getting too concerned about the facility. There is a lot of education that needs to be done. Many people have grown up in the age of reader madness, so it is important to educate your community if you can. If you're a cultivator, write articles and post educational workshops, get out there in your community and start to educate people on cannabis. Forming an alliance. So here in the Nelson region and the Kootenai region, uh, the Kootenai United Cannabis Association was formed, and it's a nonprofit organization. And uh, it, they hosted a cannabis symposium and brought together over 100 stakeholders and federal and provincial government. It, it, it was a powerful resource, and it's important as cultivators to uh, form an alliance. People really work together and it's important to build bridges and uh, work together. Next slide, please. Sorry about that. So, we have an existing medical cultivation license under the EMPR and MMAR license, and you're building a facility and you want to incorporate genetics, you do have an opportunity to transfer your genetics into your new recreational license. It's important to prepare for this. If you have pests or disease, you need to prioritize cleaning up your genetics, uh, possible tissue cultures, you can contact labs. Uh, really take the time to research and make a plan so when it's time to transfer your plants, you're not contaminating your new facility. Uh, that can lead to crop failure. Uh, it can lead to failing analytical tests. So uh, it's very important to really prepare for this. I personally do recommend uh, the integrated pest management and looking at predators, uh, insects, and uh, so for cultivators, just get really educated on pest and disease management. The good production practices. Uh, I kind of see the detection practices are the foundation of what regulations are built upon. Uh, the production practices, I do recommend anybody who is looking to uh, cultivate cannabis or process, start with the good production practices. Uh, I am, I really find for myself and for many other people that printing the Cannabis Act uh, and the cannabis regulations and the good production practices. Print it, put it in a binder. Uh, I know it sounds daunting, but read it and highlight it and get to know the cannabis regulations um, specifically if you're going to be a cultivator. Uh, I found for myself uh, that I accomplished this by creating a habit. Instead of sitting down and looking at the hundreds of pages that are necessary to read, I just started with about 15 minutes a day after dinner and uh, just did that daily and uh, got my way through it. And it also dispelled a lot of myths and uh, helped uh, me really understand uh, the regulations and why they're put in place. Uh, and the one thing to say about the good production practices and regulations is every industry is regulated uh, to protect human health and safety. The next slide, please. Uh, your HVAC systems uh, and environmental controls are the key to successfully growing indoors. Uh, this is very costly and it's important to budget correctly for this. 
and consider the servicing of HVAC equipment. Uh, like, for example, we are in a very rural area, so it is good to have extra equipment in place in case something fails. Any uh, large fluctuation in temperature humidity can be environments for pests and disease and could lead to crop failure. So when you are about to hire someone for your HVAC system, ask the company how long it's going to take for them to service it and to fix a air conditioner and also use technology to monitor your environment and make sure that as a cultivator you're always aware of your humidity and your temperature and what is happening inside your facility. Lighting, it's important to your homework on lighting and ask a lot of questions and ask for references, talk to people who have experience with the lighting company that you're and be positive, obtaining your cultivation license is possible. And uh, consider the difference between outdoor cultivation and scale up, risk what you can afford to lose. Uh, light deprivation greenhouses are an affordable way to enter into this market. The next slide. Things to consider for governments. Acknowledgement of the legacy industry. It's necessary for trust to be developed between the government and the legacy industry to move forward, and there is still a lot of stigma. A 2011 Federal Department of Justice report studied a random sample of 500 marijuana production cases, and only 5% of the files yielded any indication that the offender was affiliated with organized crime and street gangs. This is the Canadian Drug Policy Coalition report of 2016. The legacy industry consists of good people, and very few are affiliated with organized crime. And the cannabis industry has a huge economic impact. The Cannabis Act and the regulations are designed to mitigate common public concerns and risks, so read it, and cannabis production should not be feared. The barriers are high for microcultivators and processors, so it has been very difficult for small independent craft cultivators to enter into this industry. And this is mainly because of Health Canada requires a fully built facility before accepting a license application. Financing is difficult to obtain because of this, and traditional lenders are risk averse. Uh, so I think that it's important for the municipal and provincial governments to understand the challenges that the microcultivators and processors do face, and to uh, perhaps find ways to support, and as well as have compassion for the challenges. It's also important to focus on education regarding cannabis. It is a plant and it has many uses which include medicine and fiber, food, building materials. It is a renewable resource. We need to be progressive and consider the many applications and use of this plant. Uh, there is still a lot of fear and stigma around cannabis production and this can only be addressed through education. Thanks. Oh, yes, right. So there's further resources. Uh, you'll be able to get a hold of this on the website. Uh, the next slide. Um, community features there, small business BC. Oh, Portland University has some great programs. Uh, I completed the cannabis production facility and production management course. I found it quite useful. Uh, so I encourage people who are interested to look at their online courses. And that's it. Thank you very much. Fantastic, Shannon. Thank you so much for sharing those resources and that information. Um, we will likely come back to you with some questions at the end of the session. Um, but we're going to move on to our next presenter. Um, Tamara Follett, and she's going to be speaking about um, her experiences with this application process and how she was successful. So I'll hand it over to you, Tamara. Hello, everybody. 
and welcome. Um, I obtained my microcultivation license on Friday the 13th in September. Um, it took nine long months, um, but that process, I believe, has sped up some. Um, I achieved this for just under $15,000 without incurring debt and without it getting investors. But I had my own fenced land with a standalone building on it, and my township was welcoming to the industry. They saw it as a potential um, cottage industry that could help with the deficit of living jobs in the area. So um, next slide. Next slide. Okay. Um, so Health Canada wants to know what you're doing to uh, your structure. So I started with a, with a, a, a standalone garage that was on my fenced property. Um, it was a 30-year-old building. It, it was had been neglected. Um, there was cracks in the concrete. The wood um, at the base of the structure was rotting um, because of um, uh, drainage problems, especially during the winter. Um, so, so anyway, I had a lot of work to do on it to bring it up to GPP standards, and that's what this um, presentation is about. How did I bring that up to GPP standards and get it um, accepted? Uh, by Health Canada as my facility. So I ins insulated an interior wall, I added a plywood ceiling. Um, um, so let's go on to the next slide and I have pictures of all of this process. Right, so here's my garage. <laughs> this is a regular garage. Um, so the original state of the garage, you can see it as we move uh, from left uh, to right. Um, it was filled with junk. Um, it, it had cracked concrete. There was uh, water rot on part of it. So uh, so this is, this, uh, I decided um, as of uh, after the May 8th uh, directive, wherein Health Canada said um, you have to have a completed facility before you could apply. Uh, so I decided instead of doing the whole building, um, I would do one third of the building uh, because I, I couldn't afford it. I was, uh, um, my objective was to pay for everything, incur no debt um, and, and get no investors um, and make as much money as possible because of that. So, uh, so here I have a picture of the, um, the third of the garage being finished. And that is what I applied for my micro license with, was that one third of the garage finished. Next slide. So you can see the room going in. Okay, now we're inside the room looking out um, at the rest of the unfinished garage. So I insulated it and put walls up. I put ceiling up. I fixed the cracks. Next slide. Uh, that green waterproofing uh, sealant was applied to the floor um, to protect those boards. Um, I also dug a drainage ditch outside and drained the water away from the, from the building so that it wouldn't uh, come into the building anymore. So, um, so again, we're in the room looking, uh, the white wall is the new wall. Um, and then look in the center picture, you can see the ceiling going in and it was insulated as well. Next slide. So this is the finished room or almost finished room. This is what I submitted to Health Canada, um, completely painted um, with a, a, a good quality, uh, paint that is a sealant um, and uh, is very heavy duty, so it resists a crumbling when it's washed. It can be washed repeatedly and sanitized. It doesn't crumble or flake off into the product, contaminating the product. So this was what I submitted to Health Canada. Next slide. Mm. They came back with some things that they wanted to do, done to it. So this is the outside of the room. Um, you can see where I actually ran out of paint, but I submitted this to Health Canada anyway because it was the little room that I was submitting. So there's the door open, the door closed, and a close-up of the floor showing that this was a raw cement floor, and now that it is not porous any longer, and it has um, a, a very good heavy coat uh, that won't flake or chip. Next slide. So these are things Health Canada asked for. Uh, they wanted a door sweep on the door. Um, so there's the door sweep installed. Um, they don't want any cracks 
or seams uh, where mold can mold or pests can uh, hide. Uh, they wanted my um, uh, ventilation and um, and air filtration system installed. So there they are installed. And finally, they wanted a lock on my overhead garage door. Uh, that happens to be a handgun lock that worked real well uh, for that purpose. I couldn't I couldn't get any kind of a padlock to work through there. Um, but that's to keep the garage door from being opened by anybody who doesn't have a key to that little lock right there. Okay, next slide. Once they asked for these things, um, then they approved me. And so here's the room being used. Um, I used, um, because it's such a tiny room, uh, I was, I had to find ways of hanging a lot of uh, a product uh, in a very small space. My room was only eight foot by 18 foot. My entire garage was only 20 foot by 18 foot. So a little bitty space. So I um, I uh, bought all of these um, these um, racks, these shelving units, and they're on wheels. And so I hung up on there. Um, I also needed some sort of a destruction uh, method. Um, I had CRA uh, came out to do their pre-license inspection and uh, and they approved of the destruction by lawn tractor method. Um, so there you see on the right uh, destruction going on and uh, with a mulcher. I have a mulcher attached to that and it just grinds everything up and fires it off into the compost pile over there on the side. Next slide. So this is the room um, after um, drawing um, while curing is going on. So these um, shelves move around easily and they can uh, they can accommodate, you know, the totes, the different totes. I have color coded totes for each separate strain um, in the middle picture. You can see there's a little white uh, square sitting on top of the lower right um, um, totes. And that is a UB bot. It was a hundred bucks, and it texts me if my uh, environment gets out of uh, out of whack in there. And um, I also have inside the bins, I have little cheap hygrometers that just tell me what the actual humidity is inside that bin. So this is all done for very, very, very inexpensively. All right, next. Right, so here's a before and after. Uh, same corner of the barn. Uh, this is the part that I'm I'm finishing up now. Um, I was um, approved by Health Canada with only the one little tiny room, and now I'm in the process of finishing up the rest of the garage, and I'll submit a, an amendment to my license to um, to for Health Canada to recognize the rest of the uh, to approve the rest of the facility. So this would will eventually be my drying room, and so that's what it looks like on on the left as before, and then on the right after where it's been sealed and a drop ceiling put in, and uh, we're starting to seal the concrete now and paint the floor. Next slide. This is my outdoor <laughs> hand washing station. Health Canada required a health uh, hand washing station and, and it didn't need to be indoors. So here's my outdoor um, hand washing station. And it's okay that it's made of wood because wood is uh, everywhere outside and wood is the, that's the building that it's up next against the um, my facility. Uh, next slide. I thought I had a picture. There it is. Okay, so that is my garage. That's what I started with. Okay, and um, the hand washing station is now where all that fencing. I was uh, uh, improving the fencing. I had the fencing in place. It was sufficient to keep my dogs on my property, um, which is sufficient to keep intruders out. It's a six foot high fence. We'll get more into that in the next series of slides. But anyway, so this is. Um, this is the outside of my building. It had a metal roof. It was just a garage. You can even see the uh, the rot to the bottom left of the door, uh, where the that's where it filled up with water um, over uh, winter, and it, the water just sat there and it rotted away. So I dug a, a drainage ditch so that it uh, it would carry away. All right, next slide. Ah, so this is where my perimeter fence. Um, uh, Health Canada, this is the actual um, 
my dog is barking outside. Apologies. There must be somebody wandering around out there. Um, the uh, So this is where um, what I sent to Health Canada as part of my evidence package to show that there was adequate security uh, in place. Next slide. Again, Health Canada wants to know what you're what you have. So there needs to be a description at the front of your um, slides or the front of your document of telling them what kind of uh, um, security features you have. Okay, so I have an unscalable uh, steel wire fence. If you try to scale it, it will wobble and fall over and it will show damage. Um, it's a six foot high fence. It is not chain link fence. Um, Thank goodness I didn't have to put in chain link fence. This is a two by four welded wire goat fence that I used for my goats um, for many years. So um, this is uh, just um, for um, 12 gauge, 12 gauge, nope, sorry, 14 gauge. Um, there's two padlock man gates and two padlock drive through gates. Uh, there's an easement on the property. Uh, New Brunswick Power has to be able to come in um whenever they need to and so i have that written into my sop how do you handle um an unannounced uh demand for entry by uh by an authorized authority okay um so i created a second uh fence a fence within a fence um around my crop area because i have dogs i have guard dogs and i didn't want the dogs um brushing up against the product so i created a fence within a fence and it turned out to be really, really useful. It kept out, I put privacy up. Um, go ahead and put the uh, next screen up. I put privacy fencing up and um, it, um, um, it ended up keeping a lot of, of feathers and dog hair and leaves and pine needles and all kinds of stuff out of, out of the product. Okay, so this is what Health Canada is looking for when they ask you for a site plan. This is a site plan built on an, a certified survey. They want a certified up-to-date survey that shows the structures on the property. Well, I had to have this done, and I had to be done in the middle of March, and it was, it was cold out there. It was hard to find uh, the posts, but I got it done um, because Health Canada um, um, said that what I had was insufficient. They want the structures on it. So this is my property with the structures the uh i i um edited this using word and added in these um shapes to represent the trees to show that it's very secluded at the end of a road uh the red dot is the propagation um built is my building one and the grow area is the green so you can see that it's completely surrounded by a fence I have the uh, padlock gates marked on there and where an additional fencing was put in, uh, additional six foot high steel fencing. So this is what Health Canada is asking for when they ask for a site plan. Okay, next slide. They also went product flow in there. So here's a conglomerate picture uh, showing the fencing to the left of my, of, of my building. Um, it encircles the fencing and then um, they want to see the padlock. So here's a up close pictures of the padlocks. And so you can see that my fencing is old. It's not necessarily new and um, it's been uh, repaired and repaired and repaired again. And, um, and it was still approved. So, okay, next slide. Next slide. Okay, so Health Canada wanted to see all the way around the property. Um, so I, walking clockwise around the property, this is also what my evidence package looked like, uh, my or my video evidence looked like. Uh, I walked with my camera and talked. Okay, here we have six foot high fence. It's unscalable. It uh, goes all the way to the ground. You know, it's steel wire mesh. Here's a gate. Um, the gate is heightened. I don't think you can really can't tell in this picture, but the gate is... Uh, is about three feet higher than what the what the structure of the gate itself is. I added height on to the gate, um, and then I just walked around the, the edge of the property, showing that that the that was entirely uh, enclosed. Next slide. 
And I talked pretty much the whole time um, about what they were seeing and and how this would prevent um, entry and how I would know if there was entry because the dogs would bark. So then this is looking back uh, down the fence line and up to where a, a series of um, of gates are. So this is the first gate, um, the man gate into another dog pen and a close up of the padlock gate. Everywhere there was a gate, I showed a, a close up of the padlock. Next slide. Right, so we're looking back at the house now and at what ended up being the grow area where the, where the little um, pond is. The grow area is directly behind that. You'll see that in the next few pictures. Um, but as we're looking at the house, there's a fence between the backyard and the front yard. Um, and so the picture on the right is that fence, a close up of that fence showing again that it's six foot high, not scalable. Um, and, uh, you know, in circles, completely in circles of property. Okay, next slide. And so here's a close up of that gate and that it's padlocked and looking back now um, at the property from this gate, um, we can see all the way down um, and the picture on the right, you can see the pond from the other side and that's where the grow area ended up being. Next slide. And then, and the finally up to the front gate again, and from the front gate uh, to the building and, and the garage door is open um, at that point. But um, this showed Health Canada, both in the video footage and um, through my pictures, that it was an entirely secured perimeter um, that nobody could get into. Um, and I repeatedly mentioned that it contained my dogs who were escape artists. So if it could contain them, it can keep people out. Next slide. Right. So this is from the second floor of my house, looking down on the, uh, the work I was doing on the grow area. So you can see the perimeter fence around the outside, sort of the mode area. And then inside that, there's a fence within a fence. And that is a 2007 square foot area. Uh, at that time, I was planning on doing my own clones in the little propagation room. So I had a 144 square feet in, uh, of grow space inside and 2007 uh, square feet of grow space outside. And um, 2007 is exactly one foot short of the allowed 2152 square feet um, that Health Canada allows you. And um, I did that on purpose so they wouldn't be um, dickering over a couple inches here and a couple of inches there. It wasn't worth my time. So I shorted myself by, a, by one square foot. Next slide. What we're looking at in these are the uh, fence within a fence. Okay, so there's the outside fence and um, there's the inside fence showing the grow area and in the grow area i have holes dug i have terrible soil it's sand with clay clods in it so i had a, a little um um i don't know what this like a little machine come in uh, that dug all these holes and i put um um marine compost bags so that's what you're seeing in the picture is the holes dug with the marine compost bags sitting next to the holes preparing to uh to attempt to enhance the soil so i ended up later putting in privacy screen um if you drive up my driveway by where the uh where the garage is where building one is if you drive out that driveway, you can virtually see the whole property. So I didn't like that and I didn't want people um, sitting there and I, it, it's a beautiful view from that point. So I ended up blocking it off so that people would have no reason to sit there and stare down my driveway and cause my dogs to bark and my neighbors to complain. So next slide. Um, Health Canada also wanted to see, this is the 2007 square feet I was showing, um, I showed to Health Canada, this is um, actually taken um, from a, um, a, a land survey uh, application and it wasn't terribly accurate, but it was accurate enough for me to be able to show the, uh, the 
uh, the perimeter of the grow area. And Health Canada requires that you you um, justify um, your your calculations. So I had to prove that it was 2,007 square feet by doing math, and and I don't like math. So it took me a while, but I got uh, there's two separate calculations needed for for to determine the um, area of a um, a five-sided uh, pentagram. So. Uh, anyway, uh, that's just to show you the kinds of things that Health Canada will, will look for or ask for. If you have a weird shape to your grow area, you will have to justify the area um, used. Next slide. All right, so here we are looking back from the house down towards the driveway. The building is on the right. Um, that is my driveway with the privacy screen up. Um, and the grow area is on the left with privacy screen up. Um, I really ended up liking the privacy screen um, because I was able to keep out a lot of rain. I ended up stringing tarps over the over the um, crop, um, everything, because I didn't plant until I was until I was licensed. So I was planting in September. So that's that's just a Hail Mary. You're not going to get much of a crop in September. But I had the clones. Yes, they were stunted. Yes, they were root bound. Yes, they were trying to go into flower and I was keeping them out of flower. But um, uh, so I planted them because I could. And so um, it, I ended up stringing up tarps and plastic and everything over the crop because because September and October is our rainy season and rainy season out here. So so anyway, uh, so next slide. And here we go with everything growing. So uh, the two pictures, uh, the two first pictures are the crop um, inside doing unbelievably well for being stunted and um, and root bound and planted in, in September. Um, but you can see the, I, I ended up deciding I was going to have to uh, put plastic over the plant. So you see the, the, uh, the greenhouse structure uh, sort of going in um, around the plants. <laughs> We're working around plants while they're while they're growing. So, but you can see beyond the greenhouse structure, you see the uh, the fencing with the privacy screen on it. And once I go, and then on the far right, you can see the the plastic going in over the uh, the greenhouse structures. And what I discovered is that the uh, screen works real well in keeping a lot of that. We have a lot of wind. And so the rain would blow right under those uh, those tarps and uh, right under the plastic, the greenhouse plastic. So those the, the privacy screen on the side of it helped keep a lot of the uh, a lot of the dampness out of the flower. All right, next slide. And success. <laughs> so we did get some plants that really bounced back. After the uh, uh, after being so mistreated, um, and and we did get some some, but I lost uh, at least 50% of the crop to bud rot because it was just so wet and and so humid and rainy all the time. Next slide. As I've mentioned, I use dogs uh, as a deterrent. They provided 24/7 um, deterrent. Um, an alarm. They are my first response. Um, if there's anything uh, 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 that one dog is barking about, I turn them all loose in the yard and they all go running up there. I have six of these and a seventh one on the way. I've, uh, I've just um, purchased another one. They're real serious guard dogs. It's a Russian Shepherd called a Caucasian of Charka. And the dog on the left is on alert. And the dog on the right has identified a threat and is lunging at the fence with her teeth barred, bared. So, um, you know, they're a real serious deterrent. And um, people in the area know of these dogs. They know how I keep the fencing that's required to keep them. They're leery of the dogs, and I capitalize on that. So next slide. This is a dog bone, a beef bone that I have put inside of an old sneaker uh, and left it just outside of my fence. So anybody thinking about going in sees that and they don't know it's a beef bone. <laughs> so uh, anyway, this is how I um, uh, this is a deterrent um, to would be um, intruders. 
and uh, and the dogs are very uh, very very effective at that. I don't have any security cameras, um, and I leave dogs out 24/7. They they are put outside in shifts. Um, they do their shift, and then they get to come inside and sleep inside in the warmth. So that uh, concludes my um, my presentation. I wanted to try to remove some of the fear and mystique about getting a license. It's doable without spending a million and a half um, if you have a township that is willing um, uh, to work with you because um, uh, my area is, you know, is uh, is fairly residential. I'm remote, but my township, um, you know, really wanted to see this uh, this succeed. Um, we have um, uh, another, we have an LP in town, and um, and so the township was instrumental in um, in enabling me to get a uh, to get a license because a zoning of a confirmation of zoning letter is required. Um, Health Canada requires that, and um, it must mention microcultivation. And my township was very happy to provide that for me. And a lot of townships are giving a lot of people. Um, a lot of trouble and this is a really good opportunity for the township it's a good opportunity for a for a cottage industry um, for jobs that are um, that are that provide a living wage um, it's good for the economy the money that um, uh, that comes into the area stays in the area and um, and I'm getting um, a technical difficulty sign flashing up on my screen so there's a storm rolling in and i tend to lose internet when that happens so uh it's good that that's the end of my uh my presentation and um, i'm happy to take questions um thank you so much um for sharing that information really sharing kind of the steps and processes that, that, that you've taken as an individual it's so generous that you're willing to share it with the rest of the audience um that may be entering this market just to see how that it can be a simple process maybe everything that you read and see isn't necessarily 100 percent true um, in terms of costs i'm just going to let yeah. the audience know in case people weren't around at the start this webinar is um, going to be recorded and this live slides are going to be posted they're going to be posted at on our website um, gov.bc.ca backslash economic development. Um, we also are going to be sending out a survey for all the participants for this webinar. So if there's different content or more content that you want to learn about, or there's a different webinar topic that you'd like to see in the future to cover another area of this industry or a different industry um, that hasn't been covered, we're definitely happy to take your feedback and incorporate that into our future offerings. And if you're new to this webinar series, I know we did have a wide, um, wide net for this one, um, just because it was a unique talk, unique topic. But you are doing economic development work in your area. Uh, subscribe to our webinar series; you'll just be notified of all the new topics. So if we do have another webinar on um, cannabis, then you will be notified and you'll be able to register easily. So with that, with that, um, we are done the content for the day, but we're going to open it up some, for a question and answer period. We have had quite a few questions come in throughout the session, session. so I just ask that um, all three of our presenters come back online and I'm going to ask some of the questions that have come through. So the first one um, that I'm going to ask, it came from uh, for Shannon and just asking if she can supply any information on the other uh, co-op operations within her region. Uh, I know that there is the outdoor co-op uh, and they are focusing on cultivating outdoors uh, with a broad range of different farms in the area. Um, that is the one that I know is uh, in, in production right now. Great, and if anyone wanted to reach out or find out more from them, do you know how they'd be how they'd be contacted? Do they have an online presence or anything like that? I I don't actually know at this point, but someone can uh, send me an email, and I can try to link somebody if uh, necessary. Awesome, thank you so much. Um, another question that just came in from the audience and um, any of the, the you are able to answer this is, what is the definition of a micro-cultivation micro in Canada? Well, 
um, the 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 difference between a micro and a standard. Um, a micro um, has a limit of 200 meters squared of of grow space. So um, and and because we are so limited, you saw how small that uh, that area was. My grow area was. It was so small. Um, because it is so so limited, Health Canada um, allows um, us to not have uh, security cameras. Um, they are less uh, rigorous on interpretation of of um of some of the rules like allowing me to have an out outdoor uh hand washing station okay um so they are more lenient with micros um in trying to get the craft industry um uh, to embrace legalization so a micro is just a small version you're allowed to uh, um sell to other licensed entities uh, such as other LPs, microprocessors, micros, um, uh, it, even even uh, regional um, authorities. As long as they're licensed, you can sell to them. Okay, you cannot sell to the public without obtaining a microprocessing license. So, whereas before, you know, maybe people produced a product and packaged it and sold it. That's three separate licenses uh, right there. You have to have a a cultivation license to produce it, you have to, and to stamp it with the excise stamp, and then you have to have a sales license um, to sell it to the uh, to, um, to to the public. Mm. I um, to medical. So you have to you can only sell medical uh, if I understand it correctly. Um, but you could sell your sell your excise stamped packaged finished product to um you know the the bc uh cannabis store you know you can sell it to um i guess shoppers now as uh, allows uh, sales of cannabis so in other words you can sell it to you can distribute it um to companies that will buy it and put it on their shelves and sell it if you have the processing license um, you will need a sales license if you want to sell uh, medical and um, the sales license in, entails um, much of what's required for a designated grower now uh, where you have to verify the, that the person um, has the prescription and um, that you know that's the person who's coming to pick this up and, and so forth. Yeah and I'd like to add that uh, micro uh, really represents a craft market, um, a more connoisseur market, and will have uh, really high quality connoisseur products, um, generally have uh, a variety of really interesting genetics. Um, so it's really the craft market similar to beer and wine. Great, thank you so much. A, sp a question specific f for Tamara, um, just to go over how many plants do you actually have and what is your what do you define as your total growing space? Um, I didn't use my, my little room at all. Um, so I only had 2007 um, square feet of growing space. Um, I um, started with 200 clones, but they, they, uh, I lost a bunch of them during the process of waiting to be licensed. So I ended up planting about 166 clones, um, and lost, um, over the course of, uh, you know, the grow time, I've lost about, lost down to about 128. So I have right around 128 plants that I harvested. Um, and as I said, of that, um, I found, you know, I, I um, cut out about 50% of the product and just, you know, just destroyed it because it was, it was too, it had too much bud rot. There was some powdery mildew starting. It was, it was a real nightmare, even with the, um, with the um, um, greenhouses up. But uh, I'm not that my expertise is in regulatory compliance, not in growing. So I needed the experience to grow and to find and to see. And, and I tried two different strains and see which strain I was going to stick with. 
So I, I will next year be planting 200 plants in that same area. Great, and we have a couple more questions. It seems like people are really interested in your your process and exactly what your um, interactions were with some other stakeholders. So what conflicts did you have with any building codes or local government building departments, if any? Well, um, in New Brunswick, which is where I am, um, it, it, uh, at some point the um, the powers that be decided that they didn't want cannabis anywhere except in industrial zones and that makes it very very difficult so i already had a, a coning zone gah, uh confirmation of zoning letter uh from my township uh in hand and this edict was passed down from on high that you needed to be in an industrial area so uh this cost many people lose thousands and thousands of dollars. They had buildings ordered, they had land under contract, they had, uh, but they weren't in a zoning area, uh, in, in an industrial zoning area. Um, I appealed that decision because I'm outdoors and it's counterproductive to grow um, cannabis. Um, and I grow a medical strain out uh, in, in an industrial zone where you know, there's some soil and, and road dirt gets picked up on and on everywhere so I appealed it and um, and they made the decision that it did it, it doesn't count if you're if you're growing outdoors you don't have to be in an industrial zone but everybody else in New Brunswick does so that was a, a horrible um, experience because they were not grandfathering us they just said no nope, your your confirmation of zoning letter is not uh, is no longer valid and um, and we aren't uh, we aren't accepting it so that was one there's been horror stories coming out of ontario of townships deciding um that they don't want uh, cannabis um they're expecting lots of road traffic you saw how big that area is the grow area i send that picture to people say show this to your township because they they're thinking this is going to be acres and acres and acres and it's a little tiny plot of land that you can kick a can twice the length of it you know, there, I have dog yards that are bigger than, than my grow area. So, um, you know, whenever people are thinking of it, they're thinking of these acres and acres and acres or, or great big greenhouses, um, you know, that have light uh, pollution all night long. That's that's not what a micro is. And so there needs to be a great deal of education with the townships, letting them know that this is even available. The micro license is a, is a completely different a category of business than the big LPs are. But there have just been a numerous uh, awful stories. People have sunk a lot of money into it only to have their township say, nope, nope, you can't do it, not even on agricultural land. This happened in Ontario. The township just turned, uh, turned the micro applicant down for, uh, they said that she had to have um, uh, some kind of weird zoning for, she was on agricultural and they wanted, I think they wanted industrial and she couldn't, she tried to get it and couldn't get it. And um, so her plans were stopped right there. So yeah, I would reiterate what Shannon said. The very first thing you need to do is check your zoning with your township. Find out if you on your, on the property that you have or you are looking at that you can grow indoors or outdoors, whichever one or both, if you're interested in that. Um, and that a zoning of, uh, um, confirmation of zoning letter is is possible um that that will mention microcultivation it's got to mention microcultivation it can't just be your property is okay for your intended use no it has to mention microcultivation so they can't come back later and say well we didn't think you were going to do microcultivation so that's uh, something health canada requires that they're looking out for us there um for the future uh, somebody coming back and saying well we didn't really think you meant that Okay, so there's some really, I, I would encourage folks to uh, join on Facebook. We have a really nice community of people. Um, the Canadian um, uh, Craft, sorry, Canadian Cannabis Microcultivation Group, and um, it has lots of, of horror stories on there. Just look up zoning um, uh, as, a, as a keyword for do a search on there. We have um, thousands and thousands of posts on there. Um, of uh, covering all different topics from 
GPP compliance for uh, for flooring to um, you know two townships and 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 what people have done and and the and lots of people have successfully um, um, appealed to their township and gotten the zoning they need to get. But that's the first thing: check for zoning. Because if there's two things that are the, the two number one the number the two main reasons that anybody drops out of, of becoming a micro are zoning issues or um, um, inadequate funding. They just don't have the money to come up with a completely compliant facility. So I'm telling them so plant outdoors on your land. Use that money then to fund your uh, your your building. You know, start outdoors, start small, take baby steps, you know, don't don't give up. This is doable. It's feasible. Um, and you just have to be determined and say, well, OK, that door closed. Let's find another way in. So in in a so kind of a similar alignment to that, someone was curious, how much did you spend on licensing versus structure in that fifteen thousand dollars that you talked about for getting your application through? You know, so it wasn't all that much. Um, it's it was um, it's I believe one thousand six hundred and seventy five dollars to apply for the uh, license itself. It's one thousand six hundred and ninety dollars to apply for each security license. So if you had five security people, you have to have five security clearances. That's five security feet. But I only have one. I have a one man operation here. And um, so it was um, $1675, $1690. Um, it cost me $2,500 for my survey. Um, it cost me $100 for my um, um, confirmation of zoning letter. Um, and then the rest of it was all um, labor and, and uh, materials to. Um, retrofit my building and um, and create my grow area and the fencing around my grow area and, and all of that. So the licensing, it was not expensive, um, you know, and and it's, it's much more expensive to apply for a standard license, for example. Um, then as soon as I was licensed, there was two more big chunks of money, um, but I was floating on on uh, on on cloud nine because I'd been licensed so I didn't really feel that but there was the twenty five hundred dollar license fee yearly um, license fee you pay that every year plus you'll uh, I'll pay a percentage of of my profit I think it's one percent at three percent I can't remember but anyway it isn't that much um, uh, so I had kick up the the uh, 2500 and then I had uh, tried to find a surety bond company. They would not, I could not find anybody. I tried five different places. I finally got approved after I'd already choked up the five grand uh, bond for uh, for CRA. CRA needs uh, needs their, their money in um, and all that money is, is it says, it, it, it basically says if you don't pay your HST, then we're gonna take it from this fund. OK, from this money that's sitting here um, in your name. So the something that I didn't expect uh, that took me by surprise is you need a you need two licenses to be able to cultivate. You need uh, the Health Canada license and you need a CRA license in order to cultivate. Um, I stuck my poor sickly plants in the ground as soon as I could um, and didn't have my CRA license yet. And CRA was not happy with that. OK, um, they they threatened to assess me because I had planted without having a, um, a CRA license. And I couldn't understand that. I said, well, well you know, um, I have to have two licenses to plant in the ground. And the answer is yes. And that's just the way the law was written. And I explained my situation. I said, I'm, I'm looking at a winter with no income if I don't get these plants planted because I used every bit of my savings that was supposed to handle me, that's supposed to cover me for winter. I used every bit of it to create this, to get this micro license. So CRA was was uh, was nice enough to uh, to not assess me, but but they could have. And so um, it was it uh, it's a difficult choice um, that that uh, outdoor growers are going to be faced with if they don't get um, approved until late in the year. So outdoor growers apply right now so that even if it does take you nine months, you'll still have time to plant in the spring at a reasonable at a reasonable date instead of in September like I was planting. Um, and another question that's come in, how are you getting your product to market? 
Um, I was signed by Pasha Brands um, within six hours of being licensed. There's not enough craft growers out there, okay? Um, so there are many LPs who are interested in signing craft growers. So um, I will um, a package in bulk um, and then call up my buyer and tell them and they will make arrangements to come pick up the product. So they will take it and then they will um, put it in final packaging and sell it or make extracts out of it or or they may sell it in bulk to somebody else so that's that's up to them um i'm not um i i don't have a brand that i'm trying to get to be known but um but i do have a good product and i wanted it to be um uh made available um as much as possible you know when they are marketing so they are marketing marketing my product for me and shannon can you kind of provide some context how would this happen in in british columbia from your knowledge for sales uh for distribution you're getting the market or the product to market uh i think that yeah it's gonna have a lot to do with processors standard processors and other licensed producers um companies that are going to want to purchase a uh, craft product and uh that's a huge part of it as well as people that have medical sales licenses and they can sell direct to medical patients can I interject something? Um, the Pasha Brands is part of BC Craft Supply, and so they're, they are out in BC. So it was a BC LP that bought my product or, or that signed a contract with me to provide my product for four years. So um, there and there are a lot of LPs who are signing new micros just as soon as they come on board. I, you know, as soon as you say I'm licensed or even that I've applied, there there are people that are wanting to talk to you about uh signing and um there are when i started this they were signing at 350 or four dollars a gram and it's gone up since then okay because they're just um there there's just not enough micros that are applying and that are making it through so i think we're at i don't know maybe we're under 10 after over a year we're under 10 micros still that have been licensed so there's a lot of room um, and, and there's a lot of interest from lps because they do want to provide a higher end product to their uh, you know they have they have plenty of the the middle range product so what they need is some high-end product and so that's why they're interested in signing um craft producers Great. And in terms of your the 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 continuous improvement that you're doing for your property, are you um, what's what are the requirements of our crown security cameras? You had said that you're putting them in. What are your the, the requirements for micro cultivators? Yeah, Health Canada does not require um, cameras. Um, I think cameras are a really, really good idea. Uh, I'm, I'm starting on my second uh, micro site now, and I will be putting cameras in there. Um, I'm I'm using a system uh, that is, um, and, uh, and you can contact me for the name that um, that has smart cameras and it's manned 24/7. So my site can basically be unmanned. Um, at all times and it's still being monitored so um the the these cameras are, are able to pick up a crow landing in the uh, you know 100 meters away identify it's a crow and not uh, and not cause an alarm uh whereas it, it they can pick up deer at night i mean the demo was was unbelievable but it's worth it to me that system was going to cost me about twelve thousand in cameras and about 600 a month for the summer months only um, but it was completely, uh, I don't have to have any security, anything else there because they will interact with somebody approaching the gate. And they showed me where, where an, uh, um, an, an older gentleman was, was sort of just making the rounds around an unmanned site. Um, and they had him on camera and, uh, the, the, uh, the 
the smart cameras alerted the guards that there was somebody approaching the the property and so the guards came up there and they interacted with the with the gentleman uh, directly said to well the gentleman in the red sweater please leave you're trespassing we will call the police and he about jumped out of his skin so um you know it's a very very effective um deterrent before the 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 crime happens okay i don't want a video camera that's going to show me of what happened so I can hand it over to the police after I've been robbed blind. I want um, an interactive system that's gonna stop somebody uh, before they get, before they ever take their cutters out. As soon as they approach the fence, it's gonna stop them. Now, where I am, I have the dogs and they are, they're just being phenomenal. Of course, I get alerts for deer and, and porcupines and, and everything too, but um it, it they are a universal deterrent nothing wants to come up to the gate uh, with those dogs there and um but in my next site i won't have the dogs there and so i will be using this uh this smart um security uh camera video surveillance system that um that my site can be basically unmanned except when i'm there um you know to to verify that everything is is going well Awesome. Thank you so much. And we just have time for one more question. Again, thank you for um, our participants for putting in questions. We weren't able to get to all of them, but hopefully um, you can reach out to Tamara via Facebook. You can uh, reach out to Shannon through Community Futures, and then you have that email um, and contact information both for the website and the email for the Cannabis Secretariat. So the final question was for Shannon. Um, if I were to open a small microprocessing facility and had investors, do all of the investors need to be indicated on the federal government application form? Uh, I believe anybody that has controlling interest in the in your company does need to pass security clearance and standing of it. I could add something to that. You have to list everybody that has put in uh, any money on this, and then you have to justify why they don't have controlling interest, okay? So um, uh, even if you have a, a bank give you a loan, they need to be listed, and you need to uh, say they have no controlling interest, um, they cannot access the property, um, uh, you know, at their own will, uh, they need to have us presence. So you have to justify uh, why they don't have a security clearance and why they um, they can't say, look, I have a lot of money involved here. I want you to use this this um, um, prohib prohibited pesticide, and you have to use this because I I'm I'm the I have controlling interest in this company. So that's what Health Canada is looking for. They want to know who has their finger in the pie and how much control they have and you have to justify that they don't have control any control if they don't if your investor is the bank or the community futures um then you have to say they have no controlling interest they have no voting power they cannot access the property without um uh you know without a secure uh, a security cleared staff member present Awesome. Well, thank you so much. Um, thank you again for the uh, coming on and sharing this knowledge. And if you have any more questions and you uh, you we, you will be able to see the posted um, webinar as well as the slides, um, usually they'll be up by this time next week. Um, if you have any questions in the short term, you can also reach out to us at the economic development um, uh, at economicdevelopment at gov.bc.ca. Um, we're definitely not the experts in this field. That's why I would point you to our presenters with specific questions. Um, but if you need um, um, more information or think that you have a question for us, please don't hesitate to reach out. And with that, a final thank you to everyone who's joined us today and for, to our presenters. And I'm going to end the webinar.